My husband was working at the US Embassy. He was attached to the Department of State. And I had a French friend in Bangkok who told me about a meeting which was being held at the French ambassador's home. At that time, the Viet Cong were at the border and were threatening to invade Thailand. And at the meeting, I believed that the Thai Red Cross were going to make a statement about the state of emergency. I wanted to know what was going on, so I went along to the event. People that were actually living in Bangkok, and there was a couple of uh, Red Cross delegates, and there was the Thai Red Cross. And right. of course, there were other dignitaries from the, the French Embassy. After hearing the appalling situation which the civilian uh, Cambodian people were faced with because not only with the Viet Cong at the border, the, the Khmer Rouge had come across the border, um, the Thai military were there, you know, so they had really three armies, the civilian population to, to deal with terrible dilemma that these innocent civilian people were faced with. You know, they were on the verge of being annihilated one way or the other by one of the factions, you know, the Viet Cong, the Thai military and... Khmer Rouge within them. And, and disease and, and starvation. Cambodia, of course, was completely shut down. There was no news. So there's an extreme civilian mm catastrophe in the making and they come there and they mm. ask some yeah. few Europeans to come to the border as observers. When I told them that I had no formal education in any way whatsoever, how could I possibly help them? They said to me that any international presence at that time would stop the Thai military from pushing them back across the border into the Viet Cong. Thailand was in a state of emergency and the world wasn't there, and they were faced with that. These were just the things that armies do. So they yeah. were having a, a van to take various people who would come to, yeah. to this border territory, 35 or so thousand people. Yeah. What was there there? Was it nothing? Nothing. So there's no camp, there's just nothing, there's just empty land. Yeah. And they're not standing. They're not walking about. So I there mean, are. They so are. The Cambodian civilians are there. They're just there, lying on the ground. Lying on the ground, sitting, sitting, lying, black, filthy. It's quiet. So there's a. That's a crucial thing. And an mm. eerie, quiet silence. Mm. Yeah. There's a huge number of people, but yeah. nothing. Yeah, thirty thousand people. Had you ever seen anything like this in your life? No, and and even today, I mean. There's nothing. They're in the mud. They're in the the, the dirt. There's no shelter. There's no there's no structures. There's there's nothing. There's just nothing there. It's as if they're like piled up on top of each other. But you know they're just crammed in. But but there was just the two doctors and one nurse from Medicine Sans Frontières. Now this is very interesting because mm. Medicine Sans Frontières has only just been founded in 1979. No shelter. No. No food. No water. No water no latrines no and one doctor and two nurses. two doctors so two and one nurse. nurse yeah the physical state of malnourishment which all of them i mean there was nothing there where they'd come from being brought in in trucks and dumped within probably last day or two disease you know malaria neuromalaria tb tetanus beriberi topical diseases skin diseases malnourishment. The youngest child was probably five. Only few, most of them were older. And also because of what they'd been through, they did look younger than they were. There was no, it literally, they had, they were stripped of everything besides the, you know, the clothes, the black. But they had nothing. There was nothing there. I mean, it was like going to another planet and made my way through this tangled sea of people. When I got to Medicine Sans Frontières, they had a, a little bit of water. There, there was no water on the camp, there was right. nothing. There was just a little bit there in the hospital. The people that weren't in the hospital didn't have any water. I could deal with the people for some reason. And I mean, they were crawling with everything. I mean, the lice, the, the, their hair, matted ulcers on them, shrapnel, black, sick in diarrhea, terrible situation. There were two women who had come from Geneva, uh, one young woman, Nicole, and then there was an older 
lady at that time seemed older, probably she was 40 because I was like 28 or something. And they'd come out there and of course, you know, they didn't realise what they were, nobody had it, any, weren't prepared for what they were about, even people that were working in that sort of thing. And they, had, they hadn't got anything left, they had no provisions, so they had to go back to get provisions. So while I was helping in the in the Medicine Sans Frontier, Nicole came up to me and said, would I stay at night on the camp with the children that they had collected together? They were poorly too. They weren't in the hospital, but they weren't in the best of shape. And I mean, nobody in that camp was. People, there were people dying. There was only around 16. They'd got about 16 children together. And of course, I had to get permission from the Thai commander of the camp, which fortunately he spoke English and said to me, during the hours of darkness, you know, I can't guarantee your safety. And not only that, but the major part of the Khmer Rouge are within the camp. So basically, you know, you're on your own now. I've said I'll do this, so I'll do this. And there was one person in the hospital on the camp and that was it. When I saw the few people go, you know, I was okay and I had a little lantern and of course it, they'd gone back for supplies so, you know, my lantern didn't last all night. I thought I was going to be killed. They had dysentery. There's just the hospital lean-to, body, 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 bodies, bodies, bodies. I did have a great empathy to these children who had um, mm -hmm. lost their families in one way or the other, whether they'd been you know, murdered or they were just misplaced. They were ama they were amazing. There, there was something, they were so brave. I was horrendous. After I stayed with the children, I was working in the hospital and these other people come and see me. I go with them and I, and I meet the group, this group of democratic Cambodian people that say, don't leave us, we need you. It was such a desperate situation that they were in such a terrible state and there, there was no aid there. They were living on mercy from the Thai Red Cross. Those times of no food. I remember one day that, I mean, they only got cabbage and rice. They just sat and just had to... This was not a camp. This was not a holding centre. This land was from the... The Buddhist temple belonged to the temple and I believe it was the Buddhists that took them in. There was no barbed wire fence, but the fence went up in November. But until that point, anything could have happened, being either massacred, <laughs> bulldozed over, shipped across the border. To be amongst people that were starving, no food's come, but nothing. Pretty heavy duty stuff. Because I had lived the life with the US State Department and when you go abroad you represent your country. The way you act and how you are, you, you have to live at a particular respect. These are things that face people like myself who go away with governments that sometimes we are called upon. The group of democratic Cambodian people who said to me, don't go, continue to stay with us, continue to help. We had no place to put bodies. We had to protect the food from the Khmer Rouge, who'd come looking for it at night too. So we had to barricade them, the food. So the food became another story afterwards. The Khmer Rouge would come into the hospital and take all the drugs. My uh, Khmer Sari friends told me that the word had got around. The head of the Khmer Rouge within the camp, not the little scouts that were out at night time, had decided to come and visit me. Why would they want to have anything to do with me? They offered me this gold for $6,000 and there was two and a half kilos. It wasn't my place. I mean, I didn't care for Khmer Rouge people that were sick. I didn't want to deal with leaders took it off people's teeth and they took it off their hands. You know, if I got them the money, what would they do with it? Maybe if I was able to get the money, then I could go and buy the things with the gold and give it back to the people. They knew I lived there. 
and then suddenly uh, the group of democratic Cambodian people mm. they get taken to another no. camp yeah so what do you do then right I go to the camp and they're not there. Well, I couldn't remain on the camp at night without them. You got funded by the American ambassador's wife to go and get art materials. I was really concerned about their mind. They sit there on the ground all day. What can they do? They haven't got a ball, they can't. Mm -hmm. So um, I went to my daughter's uh, school and spoke to the art department. And th th from there, I purchased art supplies. So yes, um, when I came back that time, and found that my dear friends were gone. I was absolutely horrified, ter terribly upset, terribly concerned what state they would be in. And I found out where they'd gone to and I went to the United Nations in Bangkok. It was a closed camp. It was not a UN camp. It was a, it was a military training centre. The United Nations had no legislation with it. And of course, me being able to express that I'd been out there from the beginning and that I knew these people. So I had to have permission to travel with one of the couriers. I need to make sure that they are okay. Thai yeah. military permission as well? Well, I didn't have to, but I would never have got in. I get through the gate and then I go and I see an officer and then I see the commander. I want to have reassurances from the Thai military that these people are okay because I've been to the camp, they're not there, what have you done with them, are they well, what, you know, what kind of conditions are they living in? Um, the Supreme Command wrote me the best. I mean, I didn't know what it was because it, it was a coded military document. But, you know, when I got down there, the generals and the military, that I went into the war room, the room took me in. I just want to stay with the people, you know, this is what I've come to see. And that was, of course, very moving. You know, they had been put in a back of a cattle wagon with nothing again, lost everything again, traveling for two days without water in the back of a truck, probably, you know, traveling at 50 miles an hour, heat, and then they were just dumped again. So yeah, they hadn't had a particularly happy time. Of it. And actually when I went to the United Nations in February of 1980, when I documented my project for the care of an accompanied children, a reverend from Catholic Charities spoke. He said, people can't live in those conditions. And if they do, it affects them. And I can always remember thinking to myself, I've been there that long. I guess it had already affected me. I was confronted at gunpoint after hours in the hospital. Even though I did what I did, I only did it because there wasn't anybody there. No, never in my life did I ever think I wanted to work it for an aid agency or go and work in some charitable organizations. And mm -hmm. you know, I lived around a crazy situation. So if you're confronted with those situations for a long time, from what I hear medically and what fits the, my mind of how I, what I went through in 1980 and onwards until I returned to the UK, is that the adrenaline was so much in me that it had to create the pathways yeah. in my brain. Mm -hmm. And that pain in my head and that as if I can remember feeling sometimes as if everything was going into a black hole. I personally believe that that adrenaline, it destroyed every value and every belief that I had ever had in my life since the moment I was born. To retrust the planet that I was walking on. Mm -hmm because I didn't trust this planet and where I was. I mean, I really felt that I was in an out-of-body experience, but I had to come back here to rebuild my mind. And I, and I have a difficult time dealing with civilization. I mean, I can remember in the 90s when I first moved here, and sometimes I'd go with my dog up on the fields in the night when the wind was blowing. And I'd even walk in the woods. And I just, it was like, 
you know, the adrenaline, but also the wildness. My mind was wild, like an animal. My brain went back to year zero with Sakio in the early days of everything I ever knew and trusted. The world didn't look the same anymore, mm. you know. And I didn't like the world that I came to that was greedy and materialistic. I shared moments at Sakio with people in a way that was so amazingly human. And even those who came to Sakio mm. after November... They never lived there. ...didn't live there and they hadn't seen what you no. had first seen. What could meet the intensity of your, mm. as you say, kind of almost exploded yeah. sense of self? I guess I didn't know who I was when I came here, in my head. I didn't understand why I felt the way I did. I know I'll never be able to make sense of the chaos I experienced. Caring for people that died from hunger and seeing them thrown into mass graves like rubbish, walking by stacks of carts with bodies on, or having a nun ask me if I'll go with her to the pit to count the bodies. I cannot live a life that I'd normally be able to live. I feel good because once in my life, I, risk, I did risk my life for others. I saw so much darkness. They wouldn't want me to paint dark because I didn't see them dark when I saw them go from me, in, when they died. I did see people there, even though it was hard to find them amongst the dirt and the lice and the matted hair and the malnourishment and their poor state. They were people to me. But, you know, something kept me alive out there and I didn't learn it in a book. I can do things, go out to speak with groups or paint or just just try and build upon it.